or the title is called to obey God's ways. In last week's introduction, we talked about the words and how sometimes they have different meanings and that causes us some difficulties. And these verses we are looking at are um, amongst uh, the most contentious and difficult to understand um, just because of the way uh, the, the, the Greeks used and it's translated as uh, posed difficulties. Um, of course, um, some of the words and phrases are, are, are intensely difficult to uh, fully uh, guarantee that we understand what they're saying. The task of explaining and learning something from them then falls to me in order that we can find some ways where we can act upon what we learn. Let's never forget that God's word never returns to him void. It always uh, bounces back to him with uh, something of value. Now, as I said, we looked at verse 18 in some detail last week. Christ died once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Now, I hope that that's become much clearer for um, those of us that listened, whether it was in church or whether it was uh, on YouTube or uh, off the link in the website. But if you have not listened to last week's sermon, it's, uh, it's still available. And uh, I think it's hugely important to get, really grasp that um, that, that, that we covered last week. Well, let's venture on in the rest of these verses now from verse 19. It says, the spirits in prison. Um, now, these spirits are not the spirits of people. I don't know if you would pick up on that. But when the Greek word pneumata is used here as it is, um, on its own, it means spiritual beings. So the likes of angels and things like that. Now, angels fall into two camps, um, a bit like people, the good ones and the bad ones. And Hebrews uh, 1 verse 14 tells us that the good ones are sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. As we can see from verse 22 in this section, it's also speaking about good angels who submit and serve Christ. They're obedient. So the ones in verse 19 um, are, as I've termed them, the bad angels uh, and spirits, because they did not obey, verse 19 tells us. They refused to submit to Christ. And if you want to know a bit more about that, there's loads of passages in the Bible, but here's a couple for you to start on. Genesis 6, verses 1 to 4. In Revelation chapter 12, from verses 7 onwards, at least through 9 and beyond that. But it talks about um, the rebellion of the angels in heaven uh, and how they disobeyed and opposed God. See, angels, just like humans, can choose to obey or to disobey God and his rules, which are always the best paths for us to travel through our lives uh, along. Peter mentions it further in the second letter of Peter, chapter 2 and verse 4 as well. So this is a big issue for the church that Peter's writing to initially. Um, we're being told that Jesus goes to these uh, fallen angels, uh, the naughty ones, the bad ones, and, and, and tells them something. Now we're not actually told what he tells them, but it's most likely something along the lines of, Aha, look, I am alive, despite the evil plans of your leader, Satan. Um, he's alive because, it, you know, he's been crucified and killed, but he has uh, been resurrected and uh, uh, he is going to uh, make this proclamation that it speaks of in verse 9. And that's what it is. It's a proclamation. It's not, he's not going to evangelize them. He's going to tell them something. And clearly... Jesus has won, and their disobedience uh, was really a choice to be on the losing side, because evil and death and sin are now defeated. And that's what Jesus was doing between uh, Good Friday, when he, was, uh, when he was killed on the cross, 
and his resurrection on the Sunday. He, uh, we're told he went down into hell and uh, he makes this proclamation to these uh, fallen angels or um, these spirits. Still in the theme of disobedience, Peter moves on to God's protection of Noah and his family who were saved because of being obedient. Um, I think it says in Genesis, um, because of Abraham's faith in God, um, he was saved while the disobedient um, perished in God's judgment under the flood. Now, God was very disappointed if you read the Genesis verses. He was very disappointed in people. He says they were greatly wicked at that time. And as I said, we looked at sin last week and we deduced that sin always has consequences and that a price needs to be paid or God's judgment will fall. That's the two uh, options. In verse 20, it says God waited patiently in the days of Noah. See, God is a long-suffering God. He's always hoping that humanity will repent and turn from disobedience towards him and his ways and become obedient and receive the manifold blessings that are on offer. But in reality, our sinful nature often rules us and enslaves us into disobedience towards God. I was having a conversation um, before the service started. Um, you know, if it wasn't attractive to do things that are sinful, everybody would be in church, everybody would be living uh, holy lives. But it is attractive, we're tempted. And, uh, you know, people uh, make that choice on a daily basis. God doesn't delight in issuing his judgment. But on the other hand, he truly abhors evil and sin. So we're in this story of the flood and Noah is decreed as the one man who was deemed as righteous through his faith in God. Um, it, it talks about God making a legal agreement, a covenant to save Noah and his family and all the creatures who entered the ark and of course the ones that were in the water they uh, uh, survived too. Now Peter tells us that no one and his family were saved through water. In verse 21, um, in, uh, it's this water that symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of the dirt from your body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. So these are the kind of contentious verses. Um, I don't know if you picked up on that, the water. Um, Place two roles. It symbolizes the judgment of God in the flood. So because of the flood, many uh, drowned in judgment. And it also symbolizes the salvation that God offers for those who were lifted up above the water in the ark were kept away from judgment. That same water served these two purposes. There's Peter links the flood event to baptism. That's where the confusion and different theology and opinions among Christians uh, surface. But if you read the, read the scriptures as a whole, it doesn't make any sense that by being baptized, you're automatically saved. Some people do claim that, though, that baptism saves you. And if you read just literally the translation that we have, it almost sounds like that is the case. Peter, though, qualifies his words by saying, not the removal of the dirt. So it doesn't take away the sin, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It's only a pledge. Um, maybe some folk will argue that that pledge is, uh, is more, it's a guarantee, but it's a pledge. Now, water, of course, can clear away dirt on the outside but it cannot wash away the sin on the inside and nor can it give us a good conscience baptism then is a Christian ritual 
which is a covenant sign of God's grace. In this covenant, God has made us the offer, and he's set the conditions. We can have an obedient relationship with him if we keep our side of the legal deal that God makes to us. And then our conscience will surely be clean, because they'll be made clean um, in that act of uh, becoming a Christian. However, the central gospel message is that we need to repent of our disobedience towards God and invite the completed work of Christ, who also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. You see, verse 18 tells us that it was Jesus who was put to death. And verse 21 tells you that we are saved by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you can see why I'm saying what I'm saying about baptism. It's not the baptism itself that saves people, but it's what it symbolizes that is greatly significant. That is, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the righteous one, in the place of all of us who are unrighteous. So baptism then is a sign and a declaration of intent that we are being set apart and will desire to obey God from that moment on. The baptized one is offered to God for their faith in God in obedience, just like Noah, his wife, the three sons and their wives on the ark. Go and build a boat in the desert. You know, it took a long while. Um, you're saying, look, this is crazy. It's not going to rain in the, the desert. But they were obedient. From then on, once we're baptized, once we've committed our lives to Christ, we live a new life. We follow God's ways, at least we seek to follow God's ways, and we turn away from sin and evil. You see, in baptism, we're actually acknowledging that we're sinners and that there is nothing that we could do to earn God's forgiveness of our own uh, abilities or actions. Yeah, because of Christ's finished work on the cross, we can be made righteous in God's sight as we decide to set out in obedience to follow God's ways. But it's when the Holy Spirit enters into the space that's vacated by our sins that we've given over to Jesus Christ that we become a child of the living God. Our sin is paid for, all our sin for the rest of eternity. And we're forgiven and we're clean and guiltless in God's sight. The question for us concerns um, how we react to temptation. Are you aware when you're tempted to disobey God's ways? You know, we know what they are. We know that there are things that tempt us. Are you able to spot the trap and take avoiding action? Sometimes, mostly, always. You see, once we are cleansed, as we spoke about last week, our conscience helps us to avoid piling more sin onto our Saviour. We have a heightened conscience when the Spirit's in to tell us, you know, that's not right. Go this way instead. And lastly, in verse 22, it tells us that Jesus has done all that was required while he was here on earth. After the resurrection and the ascension, he returned to heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father, where he had left in the first place to come to the earth to die for your sin and my sin. And there at the right hand of God, he rules with sovereign authority over all angels and authorities and so on. And of course, the scriptures tell us that one day every knee will bow to him as Lord. 
Paul also writes about this in Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to finish with leaving you Paul's words from Ephesians 1, verse 18 to 23. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you have been called, the riches of his glorious inheritance for all his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Let's ponder these thoughts as we go through our week. Let's look for the Spirit's sensitivity when we're being offered things that are going to be fruitless or damaging. Let's choose to obey and to watch God bless us for our faithfulness. Amen. It's my great pleasure.